Welcome to OINLS 515, Introduction to Spatial Data Management, where this week we will be providing an introduction to raster data and also covering some other geospatial data concepts. So as we talk about raster data, this is a complement to our previous discussion of vector data as a commonly encountered geospatial data format, where raster data are distinguished from vector data in that raster data typically represent regularly gridded values that may continuously change across space. So in contrast to the vector data model where you had um, delimited boundaries or lines represented by polygons or linear features or specific values at individual points, raster data are much more commonly used for essentially representing the change of values across space. For example, you might think of an elevation model as an illustration of a raster data set where elevations may be represented as continuously changing values at particular intervals over a particular piece of landscape. Likewise, you could think of potentially the changes in concentration or density of whatever your uh, item of interest is, whether it's population or vegetation, particular plant species or animal species. Um, those all might uh, fall into the category of a continuously changing value that you would like to be able to represent at regular intervals across space. Also, raster data are often used to represent reflectance or uh, in the case of imagery, essentially the amount of energy that is reflected back to a sensor where then th that reflected energy can be converted into some sort of scale and then used to provide information about the surface that that energy is being reflected from. You could think of it very simply even in the case of digital photography that you might have experience in, where you have essentially a photo sensor in a camera that is measuring the reflectance of three different wavelengths of light energy, typically red, green, and blue. So as you take a digital photograph, you are actually measuring the reflectance of energy from the subject of your photo on the sensor inside the camera, where then that reflectance is written into a grid of values for each of those bands. And any given raster data set may consist of single or multiple bands representing a particular value at each pixel or location within that raster data set. You can see on this slide an illustration of three bands, red, green, and blue, in this case represented by three grayscale images where high values of reflectance are brighter in those each of those images lower reflectance values are darker pixels in those images and when they are combined into a composite image you get a color image something that we're more accustomed to looking at whether it's in aerial photography or in some uh, products derived from satellite imagery that are designed to uh, provide a more natural or true color representation the bottom line is that your raster data are best used in any of those situations where you have continuously varying data uh, uh, through space that you want to essentially represent in some way um, that really does not fit into the sharp boundaries that are aligned with the vector data model. In addition to um, raster data as a continuous uh, representation of values through space, 
Just as we discussed for vector data previously that you can transform a variety of data into vector data, you can also derive uh, vector data or other representations of data from raster data. So in this case, we have an illustration of deriving some data from an elevation model for the um, Albuquerque East topographic map. So the image we see here represents elevation values for this area over the city of Albuquerque. And within a number of geospatial tools, you can mathematically derive, in this case, a set of contour lines that approximate the lines of equal elevation as they're derived from that digital elevation model. If you've ever worked with topographic maps, you may be familiar with these types of contour lines that may be used to help visualize changing in the changes in the shape of the map, the terrain, um, as a complement to other ways of representing elevation, which we might have here in terms of this color change. You can envision um, other uses of this sort of contour um, mapping capability where you might have another um, measurement, say population density or density of particular plant or animal species in the landscape, where you might want to develop a quantitative map that shows not just that sort of continuous change through time, but where you also can complement that with the contour lines that represent sort of areas of constant value within that as an additional reference for visualizing those data. Another product that you will see in some cases, especially when uh, working with elevation data, are uh, hillshade products that can be calculated from an elevation model, where those hillshade products can um, help to highlight areas of um, of changing values in the terrain, essentially allowing you to use your visual uh, system to be able to recognize either texture, as you can see in this image, where you can actually make out the, uh, the streets and neighborhoods and certainly the edges of the arroyo in the southern half of the image, um, based on the texture of the hillshade that's been generated. Very often, though, hillshades are actually combined with other data to actually enhance the visual interpretation. You see this in many um, mapping applications or map products where a hillshade has been um, overlaid on top of other data to help emphasize the changing changes in the terrain and, in some cases, the texture of the landscape, which you can see here where even with the slight, the combination of that um, hillshade model with the uh, that original color um, coding of the elevation model, you start you start to be able to see the areas of town, uh, the city of Albuquerque, where you can still make out that sort of rough texture provided by the neighborhoods and the streets separating the neighborhoods. And the edges of the arroyo, while they were uh, represented by changes in color in the original image, definitely do stand out a little bit more clearly when you overlay that hillshade on top. So this is another example of how you can drive um, data from a raster data set um, to create or enhance your cartographic or analy analytic use of raster data. Raster and vector data are not the only types of data that you're likely to encounter. And one that we're going to work with quite a bit in the coming weeks um, relates to geodatabases, or essentially geospatially enabled databases, where in addition to some of the more standard data types that most databases support in terms of being able to encode, say, dates, times, 
text content, numeric content in a variety of formats, geospatially enabled databases extend that model further to uh, allow for explicit support for storing, accessing, and um, processing geospatial data. So depending upon the particular geodatabase that you're working on, they may contain um, data types within the database representing vector data. That's actually the most common um, data type that you'll find in geospatially enabled databases. Um, raster data, um, many geodatabases now also support raster data. While there are some arguments pro and con on the um, utility of storing raster data within the database or outside of the database in terms of performance and portability. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the coming weeks. Um, and also tabular data that may contain geospatial references or geospatial information that you otherwise need to potentially process further to um, be able to map or, pro or analyze those data in a geospatial context. Finally, geodatabases will often go beyond the mere storage of geospatial data, but in most cases they also implement specialized functions within the database that allow you to use the native language of the database, often structured query language or SQL, to actually perform spatial uh, functions inside the database, whether it's a matter of calculating buffers around points that may be stored in the database, or selecting features or records from a, a, a table that contains uh, geospatial data based on location, um, or also processing and transformation of data to derive new geospatial data products all within the database itself. This is an incredibly powerful tool for being able to, in some instances, essentially use a geospatial, geospatial database or geodatabase as a basic geographic information system, as some core data management and transformation functions are actually native to the database itself. As you start working with data in a variety of systems, whether they are raster data or vector data, whether they're stored in freestanding files or within geospatial databases, the core concept of geographic coordinates is key to the consistent understanding and use of geospatial data. When we're talking about geospatial coordinates, we're talking about one aspect of it where we have a fundamental challenge of flattening the Earth, which is a, an oblate spheroid, if you want to uh, be precise about it, meaning that it is actually not a perfect sphere, but it's actually somewhat flattened, where it's a little bit um, wider at the, at, the, at the equator than if you were to uh, measure it from pole to pole. So it's actually slightly flattened, and there are mathematical models that describe exactly what the shape of the Earth is. But even if we think about it in terms of, of a perfect sphere, the challenge that we have is that analytically and visually, we're often wanting to work with geographic locations, not in a spherical coordinate system, but instead in a flattened Cartesian coordinate system with x, y values. As soon as we think about doing that, we're confronted with an infinite variety of ways to essentially take the skin of our planet and flatten it in different ways where the, our methods for choosing that are highly dependent upon what our goals are. So as we think about our planet and our interest in being able to do mapping or analysis based on features on the surface of our planet, we need to be thinking about all the options that we have available to us. 
And in this case, those options really are infinite. And we have to start instead thinking about what our goals are for our particular representation of features on the surface of the planet. Or as you're getting into geologic and other mapping, perhaps even features uh, below the surface of the planet. Here we're going to be concentrating primarily on the Earth's surface. Um, thanks to XKCD, we have um, actually a useful visualization of some of the myriad options you have for uh, representing features on the planet. So here we have um, a whole uh, list of different uh, map projections that um, the author of XKCD has made some editorial comments about. The bottom line is that as we look through these, each one has been developed to meet a particular need and where that need is defined by the you know, typically the person who is defining what um, what mathematical transformation should be used to map every point on the Earth's surface to a corresponding X Y coordinate in a drawing of that Earth's surface. And you just get a sense of some of the diversity um, that in, in even this simple cartoon of the different map projections that you might encounter um, and some of the, the names associated with those. The bottom line is that you have to know what the projection is, what the map projection is, or what the coordinate reference system for your data is. And even if they, the values superficially look similar, even if they are latitude and longitude, you cannot assume that they are actually equivalent. Um, you must know the specific projection coordinate reference system to understand and be able to compare data provided in different geospatial data sets. If you merely assume that coordinate reference systems are the same, you may very well find that your results are um, invalid or at best imprecise in that, you know, if things are even shifted a little bit, you may actually um, not even notice the difference, but you're going to end up with results that are not, um, not very accurate. So you must, in all cases when working with geospatial data, define the, the coordinate reference system if they are data sets that you are creating, or know what the coordinate reference system is for data that you are using that have been provided by others. The reason for this is that all map projections are not created equal. Every map projection or coordinate reference system represents a trade-off between different types of distortion as you convert from that oblate spheroid to a flat two-dimensional um, representation or visualization of those data. And you can typically choose between these broad categories of distortion or minimized distortion. One is area. If you're working in a field where being able to calculate and maintain consistency of the area, so say you're doing um, sampling of vegetation density within um, particular map quadrants, having those map quadrants equal in area to each other may be key to your calculation of plant or, or other species density within those areas. So you may very well, in that case, want to be working in a map projection that has defined to maintain um, equal areas in different parts of the map that you're working in. Um, you may be working in a discipline or area where direction and shape are the, uh, the key components of your map where you want to make sure that first and foremost, direction and shape are maintained um, where distortion of those are minimized. You could think of it in terms of perhaps navigation. 
So whether it's aerial navigation or, um, or, uh, or uh, ship navigation, where you want to be able to have a clear correspondence between the direction that you might measure with your compass and direction as it is represented on the charts that you're using to track the location of your plane or your ship. Finally, you may want to make sure that distance as it's measured on the map corresponds well to distance um, on the ground as you cover the same, uh, same area or feature. Um, this is um, another example of, you know, if you're doing uh, sampling transects or other, other activities where you need to make sure that you're measuring um, consistent uh, counts along a particular uh, length of a sampling transect, or if you're trying to measure uh, propagation of signals, say you're, you might be working in seismic applications where you want to be able to make sure that the distance calculations you're using for the propagation of um, a seismic sing signal is correct. Um, you, in those cases, you may want to work in a map projection that maintains um, very little distortion in distance. The bottom line is, is that Different map projections can be uh, can essentially provide a mixture of distortion in these three areas, and you need to be thinking about what types of distortion you can tolerate and which types you can't, so that um, you choose the correct map projection uh, for your particular work. Um, one of the other things that you will encounter is that some map projections are commonly used uh, cartographically for particular areas of the earth. So if you're wanting to generate a map, say of the state of New Mexico or of uh, North America, you may find that um, if you generate a map using a map projection that is uh, not commonly used, you may come up with a map that looks odd or unusual to others because the shape, for example, of the state or North America doesn't quite correspond with what people are familiar with. So that's something else to think about as you're uh, also even not working with map projections analytically, but also cartog cartographically in terms of what are the common map projections that are used and that people are familiar with so that you can present data in a way that is consistent with people's experience working with maps. As we think about map projections, one of the other concepts that is used that influences these, uh, er these types of distortion are essentially the underlying geometric forms um, upon which the Earth is projected to produce those two-dimensional representations. So you'll see in the names of some projections reference to either cone or conical, cylinder or cylindrical, or plane or planar, where th these are um, all different geometric forms that um, essentially provide the uh, surface upon which the, uh, the Earth surface is projected and are used to provide that um, sort of geometric primitive for the transformation from the oblate spheroid of the Earth into this two-dimensional space. So you're likely to encounter these terms as you're looking at the names of some of the um, projections that you might encounter. So as we've seen, there are myriad potential map projections. Um, and the fortunate thing is that there are a number of systems that have been developed for being able to communicate efficiently the definitions of those uh, myriad coordinate reference systems or map projections. One of the most common are EPSG codes, where EPSG was a, a European Petroleum Standards Group that developed numeric codes for many map projections where many geographic information systems and other tools use EPSG codes as a shorthand 
for referring to the definitions of those projections, essentially the mathematical transformations um, from a uh, spherical coordinate system into a projected coordinate system. If you're working in the ESRI GIS world or exchanging data with people working in that, you may encounter the ESRI well-known text or WKT format um, either within the interface or as a part of the documentation for a particular data set or you may find that in some cases for example for ESRI shape files a vector data file format that we'll talk about in just a minute um, there is an associated .prj file that contains that ESRI well-known text as uh, the essentially the content of that projection file that some GIS programs will use to figure out what the spatial reference system or map projection is for a particular data set. The PROJ4 um, coordinate transformation library is a very popular and broadly used uh, software library that that allows for transformations from one coordinate reference system to another. And it has a particular syntax for defining those transformations. Um, in many instances, you may actually find the PROJ4 definition of a particular um, coordinate reference system uh, as a part of the definition of or documentation for a particular coordinate reference system or map projection. So that's something that you may encounter. Um, finally, another commonly encountered way of defining what a map projection is, is a standard out of the Open Geospatial Consortium, or OGC, um, that's also a well-known text, or WKT. In this case, it's the OGC WKT, where they have also developed a specific way of structuring and presenting the information about a particular map projection um, in a way that uh, provides the information needed to implement that projection in software. Overall, a good resource for tracking down the reference information in a variety of these formats is this link here, spatialreference.org, where you can look up uh, by EPSG code or ESRI reference um, or WKT, um, different coordinates reference systems and then look at more detailed information about those reference systems and corresponding definitions in a variety of formats. So that's a handy site for being able to track down information about a variety of spatial reference systems. Now I'd like to talk briefly about accuracy and precision as we're talking about location data because these are other key characteristics of data that you're working with that have a geospatial component. When we're talking about accuracy and precision, these are some definitions that I pulled out of Sokol and Rolf's biometry uh, statistics textbook where Accuracy is defined in terms of the closeness of a measured or computed value to its true value. So essentially accuracy relates to what is often an unknown true value, but through repeated measurements, you may be able to better estimate that true value. If you are dealing with a biased instrument or computational system where repeated measurements are not actually bringing you uh, a better approximation of a true value, you in that case may be dealing with a less accurate um, instrument or, or computational method compared to one that through repeated measurement actually does help to, um, to uh, better define what that true value is. Precision, on the other hand, Re relates to the closeness of repeated measurements of the same quantity to each other. So when we're talking about precision, we're not talking about the precision relative to any sort of true value. Instead, we're talking about repeated measurements and their 
uh, essentially their closeness to each other. So you could think of it as how tight or, or loose a cloud of measurements is of the same quantity. Here we have an illustration of accuracy and precision where we have a hypothetical true x and true y, true, uh, y value represented by the vertical and horizontal lines respectively. In the first case, number one, represented by all the black dots, you can see that we have a set of repeated measurements where the cloud, that cloud of measurements does appear to be relatively well centered over the intersection of that true x and true y value. So in this case, you might be able to um, think about the measurements in case one as being relatively accurate in that these repeated measurements seem to be, um, when taken as a whole, uh, they seem to be clustering around this hypothetical true x and true y value. When we consider the situation for number two, where we have a similar set of repeated measurements, here represented by the red dots, it looks like they may be distributed in about the same way. So in that respect, they may have about the same precision as number one, in that the size of the cloud of observations doesn't look terribly different from what we saw in one. But it may be less accurate in that that cloud of measurements does not appear to be um, centered as nicely over this hypothetical true x and true y value. So in this case, number two may be um, equally precise with number one, but it may actually be less accurate in that those measurements actually do not correspond as well with the true x and true y values. Finally, if we look at number three, represented by the cloud of blue dots, you can see here that the cluster of observations is actually much tighter, suggesting that we may actually have a higher degree of precision in the measurements in that they are more tightly related to each other. But we may have, um, again, in comparison to number one, a less accurate measurement or set of measurements in that they also do not seem to correspond with the true x and true y value that we have for this theoretical example. This is an illustration of these different concepts of accuracy and precision as you would think about it in terms of, say, the x-y coordinates that you would use in a geospatial data collection. So how does this relate to spatial data? You know, when we're talking about location, location is estimated using a wide variety of methods, each of which has its own known or unknown accuracy and precision. And just some examples of those include uh, geocoding, as we uh, discussed previously, as a way to estimate geographic coordinates from street addresses, where the accuracy and precision of the underlying database uh, from which those coordinates are estimated can have a significant influence on the accuracy and precision of the coordinates that, are, that come out of that. Um, satellite or aerial imagery um, may have a uh, measured uh, error in terms of the location of the individual pixels and the features that you may be uh, viewing in that imagery that is represented by those pixels. In some cases, if you're doing mapping on the ground using total stations or laser rangefinders, those may also have particular, particular known accuracy and precision, but if they're not used properly or calibrated properly, you may actually have additional bias um, that is affecting um, the uh, accuracy of the measurements, or also um, if they're not maintained properly, the precision of those instruments may be degraded if they're, again, they're not properly maintained, or if they're used outside of the specifications for, uh, say, measurements over distance or over different types of terrain. 
um, and global positioning systems, which also are dependent upon a constellation of satellites that as that constellation changes, as essentially the configuration of the satellites changes, the uh, accuracy and precision of repeated measurements using a GPS may also change. So keeping that in mind, in terms of the specific data that you're getting out of a GPS, needing to keep, the, keep in mind that the changes in that accuracy and precision is key. When we talk about sources of bias, really in this case um, uh, relating to the accuracy, um, you, there are many, many ways to introduce systematic errors into um, your systems um, where in some cases it may be a matter of choice. In some cases it may be um, an error in, in, what is, in how the data are being collected. As one example, the choice of an incorrect datum for a horizontal or vertical reference could introduce a bias. Um, we've already talked a little bit about miscalibration of instruments. Um, if we uh, think about, you know, uh, miscalculation of the control point that might be the origin that's used for other map points, if that control point is not accurately located, that, then it can shift every, all of your other measurements based upon it um, to incorrect locations. Um, a, a damaged instrument, like a stretched measuring tape, can introduce bias to your, um, your, your data. Um, other sort of field characteristics that can impact your instruments, like strong electromagnetic fields that may affect your, um, your GPS or your compass, is something that you need to be thinking about. Um, map projections. As we were talking about earlier, your choice of map projections or application of the wrong projection or assuming the wrong projection can certainly introduce bias and error into your mapping. Um, the use of data that are collected or presented um, outside of the range of map scales for which they are appropriate um, is another area and we'll see an illustration of that in just a moment here. These are only a few examples of the many ways in which you can introduce bias into location that you represent in your data. But, you know, for that matter, you, you need to be thinking about bias, accuracy, and precision in the context of any of the data that you're working with because those have significant impacts on your ability to use those data to answer the research questions you're asking. Coming back to map projections, you know, in the context of this discussion of bias, we think about, again, the design characteristics of particular map projections, where those map projections, unless they are global in scale, are typically designed specifically to focus on a particular world region and design with a particular goal of retaining one or, or having a compromise between uh, retaining characteristics from more than one of these aspects of direction, distance, and area. And they are defined in reference to the preferred units of that coordinate reference system. So while there are an infinite number of potential map projections, each one of them is defined in a particular way to support a specific um, mapping or analysis uh, activity. And you need to think about that as you're working with the map data that you're creating or, or using that were created by others. This is just an illustration of the drift in GPS points for over a 24 hour period. This was created by one of the master's students here in the geography department, uh, Lisa Arnold. And you can see from this over 24 hours, um, whether it's the GPS unit itself represented by the black dots or the GPS unit as, a, as an internal correction is applied, the green dots, in both cases it looks like there's a pretty substantial bias to either the east or the west as these coordinates drift over a 24 hour uh, period for a fixed point. So this is a GPS unit that is at a known fixed point and then each of those points is being compared 
to um, that, that fixed point to map it relative to that known location. So as we're thinking about using GPS as a way to, uh, to represent the positions of, of phenomena on the landscape, you need to always be thinking about the accuracy and precision of the GPS points that we're getting. This is a representation of two different maps and map scales where you can see the difference in the degree of detail um, and also potentially the difference in essentially the uh, precision of the features as they're depicted in the map as they were essentially defined at different target map scales. On the left, we have a map scale of 1 to 250,000, where essentially one unit on the map represents 250,000 units in space. So that would be one inch equals 250,000 inches, one mile equals 250,000 miles, etc. On the right, we have the same area uh, depicting the 1 to 24,000 USGS topographic quad, where there is much more detailed information and the mapping standards for draw maps drawn at this scale require a higher degree of precision and accuracy in terms of the locations of the features relative to their um, positions on the ground. So as you're integrating data sets into your analyses, you need to be thinking about map scale for which those data were created and how they align with the map scale that you're working with. This is another illustration of that phenomenon and that we actually here have two hydrography data sets, both of them from the National Atlas, um, essentially the, the U.S national access point for a variety of geospatial data sets. One of them depicts hydrography, essentially the, um, the stream network, and the other one represents streams and water bodies. So both, uh, at least in the area where you can see they're both along the same major stream channels, theoretically represent the same um, phenomena but in the case of number one, you can see that there's actually um, much greater detail in the shape of the, you know, whether it's the Rio Puerco or the Rio Grande, um, compared to number two, where the, the, uh, essentially the river courses are much more sort of linear and have been straightened out quite a bit, obviously uh, reflecting the intention for those to not be used at this at this particular map scale, but instead being intended to be displayed at a much um, much uh, smaller map scale, say at the regional or state level, where these deviations from the more detailed configuration of these rivers would not have a significant impact, at least visually in the map. So this is another illustration of the different map scales that would or would not be appropriate for use in a particular application. Finally, let's talk a little bit about data formats and tools. As we've discussed now, a variety of data types, whether it's tabular data that you might use to feed into the creation of vector data or raster data, um, some things that you're likely to notice is that there are some common formats that you're going to encounter. So when dealing with tabular data, you're likely to encounter comma-separated value data. So that's essentially an ASCII text file where the values are uh, separated from each other by commas in a line of text. Um, in some cases, you may encounter tab-delimited files, which are a similar structure but with tabs separating the values. Um, you may encounter DBF files. These, this is a format um, that was native to the DBase uh, database uh, program many years ago, and it continues as the internal database storage model for ESRI shapefiles. It can be used for exchanging uh, structured tabular data with, between applications, and that's a format that you may encounter. One that you're often going to see is Excel spreadsheets. Um, Excel spreadsheets can work 
reasonably well for exchanging and representing tabular data, but they must be structured very nicely to be able to do it effectively. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we work with the specific data that you're working with in your projects and as you're downloading and examining data as a part of our class assignments. As we move on to vector data, you're likely to encounter ESRI shape files as those uh, doc files which actually consist of three or more individual files that are inside in a bundle. Um, you're likely to encounter ESRI shape files as a common uh, format for exchanging vector data. Uh, more recently, the um, KML file format, formerly known as Keyhole Markup Language, but now it's just KML as it's been adopted as an Open Geospatial Consortium standard, provides a way of exchanging um, both uh, the ge geometry information, associated attributes, and information about how those features should be represented in a single file. There are some strengths and weaknesses to the KML file format in terms of being able to uh, attach attributes to those features, but it's an increasingly used format, especially for visualization. GML, or Geography Markup Language, is another format that you may encounter, and it's one, another one that has come out of the Open Geospatial Consortium. And it's, it's a standard that is commonly uh, used for exchange of vector data across a wide variety of GIS applications in that it's an open standard that anybody can, can implement. Finally, when we get to raster data, um, you're certainly going to encounter GeoTIFF files, which um, are a, an open standard for uh, representing uh, gridded data, even single band or multi-band gridded data. You may encounter ECW files, which are a, it's a compression scheme for being able to take what can be very large raster data sets and compress them down into much smaller files, but sometimes at the expense of throwing away some data as a part of that process where the algorithms that they use um, are designed to minimize the impact of that data reduction, but keeping in mind that data um, may also be lost as a part of that compression process. Depending on the domain that you're working in, you may also encounter NetCDF or HDF files, which are essentially multi-dimensional um, gridded file formats used broadly in the modeling uh, community, climate modeling. Um, they're also uh, often used in the remote sensing uh, as far as HDF goes. So depending on the particular domain that you're working in, those are some other somewhat common raster data formats that you may encounter. This is, these are just samples of the more commonly used formats, and there are many others out there, but if you become familiar and comfortable with these, you'll be a long way towards being able to work with others as you encounter them. Finally, we'll discuss briefly the tools, and specifically geographic information systems, as a technology for being able to work with these diverse data. So when we're talking about geographic information systems, they provide a number of functions. Um, they allow for data creation and management. So as you're um, working with geospatial data, uh, they provide some streamlined methods and tools for both creating and managing data in a unified system. They will often provide tools for being able to develop documentation associated with those data sets whether it's through a matter of ongoing collection of processing and embedding that information in new products as they're generated or providing specific interfaces that you can use to create documentation, they can help with that. They are primarily, and one of their greatest strengths is integration of data using geograph geographic information as a means of being able to integrate disparate data sets in a combined visualization and anal analysis environment where you can do both the mapping and analysis and data processing um, in this integrated environment where location is the key common variable that is shared across the, these different products. Many of them offer a programming language or programming environment where you can automate the processes that you define. 
so that as you essentially develop uh, workflows, you can encode those workflows using their programming language, and then you can modify or re-execute those workflows again and again using different input data or generating different output data, but being able to do so programmatically. And finally, many GIS uh, programs now have the capability of enabling to some extent or another sharing and publication of your data, whether it's transferring data into some sort of server platform or whether they actually have some sort of server platform built into them, there's uh, an increasing sharing and publication capability within the geographic information systems. We're going to be working with Quantum GIS in this course as it allows us to have a common platform that we can uh, work with general GIS functionality and work with a variety of data sets across operating systems. So whether you're a Mac user, Windows user, or Linux user, you can run Quantum GIS. But the capabilities that you work with in Quantum GIS and the strategies you use for data management creation and production will easily transfer into other geographic information systems like ESRI or Manifold or other systems. So while we will be working in quantum GIS, the knowledge you gain can be easily transferred into the specifics of those other interfaces. And with that, I encourage you to now start experimenting with the variety of data that are applicable to your particular research domain and start experimenting with these concepts as you gain an understanding of the data and their underlying documentation and start working with methods for being able to integrate these data into your research program.